Hi, my name's Darren. I'm one of the Queensland Transport Approved Boat Safe Training Providers. And today we're here at one of the boat shops. Uh, they've been kind enough to lend us a boat to do a walkthrough and show everyone the different parts in the boat. We're going to start here at the front of the boat, which is called the bow. Uh, we have two sides in a vessel. We have the port side being left-hand side. We have the starboard side being right-hand side. You'll notice here up the front here, we have the rego numbers. Rego numbers in Queensland, minimum height of 200 mil. They do actually go both sides and they need to be a different colour to the craft. Also you'll see here the registration label. It goes exterior port side adjacent to the rego numbers. The other features in the boat, we have the gunnel edge. It's true name, gun wall, got its name hundreds of years ago. The old pirates used to hang the guns on the sides of the ships and that's where it's got its name, gun wall. We slang it a bit in the gunnel. Following down through the hull, the hull's the whole structural body of the vessel. You come down to the keel. This is where the bottom sheets underneath meet the side sheets, right here in the corner. So if we walk back through the boat, this, this particular boat has been fitted with a bow plate. It's pretty common in this day and age. People like to put a, an electric bow mount motor on the front. Coming back through the boat, freeboard. Freeboard's the minimum distance from the waterline to the lowest part, whether it's the gunnel edge or on a small tinny, we actually have a motor cut out. So freeboard, height of the sides in other words. When we go to the back of the boat, this is called the stern, which is the rear or aft end of the vessel. We then come round and we use the, st the transom, which is the stern cross section. Okay, um, your motor, it bolts on here to the transom. You should always check your boat, um, especially an old fiberglass hull. They were notorious for rot in the transom. The motor pulls out, the boat sinks, you've got a problem. So here we have the outboard. Uh, I like to make sure that I start it before I leave home to make sure that the battery isn't flat um, and that it pumps water and that everything's intact. One of the big things you need to make sure is that your locking nut's tight and the tabs are bent over so it can't undo. Other outboards have pins through them, a shear pin, you'd want to make sure that that uh, hasn't got any damage and it's in good working order. I always like to spin it, make sure nothing's been caught in there and you're probably good to go. Probably worth always lifting the cowl off, have a visual inspection. Underneath the engine, you can see that looks in really good condition. Being a four stroke, nice quiet, smoke free engine. Pull the dipstick out, just like your car. You'd want to make sure the level's full, which it is. Have a look, make sure everything's intact. I always like to check that the steering's okay as well. It's quite common if you don't lubricate with some oil, um, that the steering's locked up while it's been sitting in the garage. All the salt water sticks to the steering, goes inside, locks down, jams the steering. You go all the way to the boat ramp to find that it's seized. So if you do all these checks, be good to go. So one of the most critical things that I see people forget to do before they put the boat in the water is put the bungs in. Two bungs on this boat, if you notice we just put them in nice and tight. Once they're in, they're in, it's pretty hard to forget. I always like to run a motor support bracket, it gives the, the, the motor full support while you're towing down the freeway, it just clips under there, you bring it down, you make sure you put it on the water pickups so you don't bust the wings off the, the gearbox. Nice and tight there. Little locky straps, always a good friend. And we're good to go. Okay, so now we're gonna get in the boat and we're gonna talk about some features that are internal ones on the boat. Up over the ladder. In through over the transom. So up the front we've got the bow roller where the anchor rope and chain slides over, makes it nice and easy to throw the anchor out and retrieve it. We then have the anchor well, we have the cleat. It can be two horns as displayed, or it can be actual cross. So this particular boat's got a nice big front casting platform to stand up and cast and retrieve fishing. It's also got some good storage. So while we're here, let's talk about the safety gear. It needs to be in a nice, easy, ready, accessible place. It's all under the front hatch here. Uh, new law that's come in, we need life jacket stickers um, to indicate where the life jackets are. It's a possible $200 infringement uh, if you don't have any life jacket stickers. The other thing you have to do now, each skipper who's in charge must give everyone a safety briefing of where everything ex is exactly 
at a life jacket demonstration, it's another possible infringement now in our state, which is a good rule, because at the end of the day, it's all about safety. So let's have a look under the hatch. As you can see, life jacket sticker here, nice and clearly visible to everyone that would come on board. So here we have traditional life jacket. This is a type one. You need to make sure that you check that it has the official type one stamp, weight category to suit the correct person, and an Australian standard. You can't put adults in kids sizes and kids in adults. We've got a couple of jackets there. We've also got a container here. This has got a V sheet in it, which is a distress signal. It's also got a mirror. We've got a spare piece of rope. We've got a spare anchor. We've got a nice first aid kit. We even have a drogue. If we were broken down, it'd slow down our rate of drift. It's another form of anchor. Certainly won't hold you in the one spot, but certainly slow down the rate of drift. Not a bad thing to have if you're in a breakdown situation. The last couple of items we've got is a paddle. Good idea to have a paddle. You know, certainly in this size boat, a little bit hard to paddle anywhere, but you could certainly fend off rocks, oysters, you know, anything that might cause damage. This boat's actually got a fire extinguisher in it. The white band, powder type for fuel, oil and electrical fires is the requirement only if the boat's over 5 metres. This is only a 4.7 metre boat. It's not really a requirement, but hey, if you got it, you got it. How bad can it go for you? Make sure it's in date. If you've got a fire extinguisher, when it's a requirement, um, it is part of the law. This boat's even got a knife. It's in a protective um, cover. It's a good idea to have a knife, I think, on board. Sometimes, you know, if you're dead set, couldn't get that anchor up, you might have to cut the rope. Not preferable, but hey, uh, it's always a good handy tool to have on board and have it in a nice, safe place away from anyone. So here we are sitting back in the helm's position. The helm's position is the driver's position. So whether it's a forward steer or tiller steer or even the rudder on the yacht, that's called the helm. Some key features here, knowing all about the helm is kind of critical. Everything in a nice, easy, accessible place where you can get hold of it. So let's have a look and run through a couple of things. Obviously we've got the steering wheel, make sure it's nice and soft and that, and it hasn't seized up as we talked about before. Um, we've got a sounder here to tell us how deep it is under the boat. Over here we've got speedo, we have a taco, we have our fuel gauge, kind of important. You'll notice in most boats the fuel gauge isn't a constant um, holding position. It flickers up and down with the surge in the fuel tank. It doesn't have a delay in it like a car. We have the engine hour meter here. Um, they actually work off electrical current. So if you left the key on overnight, it'd click its hours over. It doesn't work off the actual engine running. We then have our three switch panel here in this particular boat. We have the navigational lights, which we'll talk about in a sec. We have auto bilge with manual override. We also have a live bait tank in the rear in this model. We have a spare switch here as well. We have the VHF marine radio. Channel 16 for emergencies um, anywhere in the world. Obviously, if you're in trouble, it'd be good to go and do the op uh, marine operator certificate of proficiency, the marine radio license. Um, knowing the language, what to say, when to say it, and when not to say anything is really cr critical in a rescue. We then have the controls. You'll see it locks into um, neutral. To put it in the gear, most, most gear sticks have a button. You must depress the button, push forward. It locks into gear, and to accelerate, you just keep pushing forward. To pull it out of gear, a flat hand required, pulls back, locks into neutral position. If you grab the button, it selects reverse gear. Never seems to go good for any gearbox. So to go to reverse, obviously pull the button up, slide it back and accelerate back there, flat hand forward. Obviously we have the key. We also have, most critical thing I think in boating is the safety lanyard. You know, uh, a, good, a good safety tip is obviously if you're driving, if you wear this safety lanyard, have a clip to yourself. If you ever lost control and fell out of the boat, that'll actually pull and it kills everything. So the boat doesn't end up driving itself to Fiji or into any other vessel on the water. So safety comes first, it's a good tip. So here we have the traditional anchor light. Uh, must be used between sunset and sunrise or any time of reduced visibility. Um, 360 degrees visible is the law. Okay, so here we have our battery. 
uh, marine grade quality battery, always a good thing to have, make sure it's charged. I always like to charge them, uh, put them on charge before I go, that way I know it's got full capacity. Let's have a look at the battery switch just behind the battery box. I'll pull it out for you. So a good tip is to make sure that you turn it off when you finish with the boat after you've washed it, washed it down and flushed it out, turn it to off. If you've got a little SeaTech charger, it's not a bad idea to leave it on charge um, all the time and that way when you come out to use your boat next, it's already got its full charge in the system. We also have here uh, the fuel water separator filter. It's always good to check. Um, make sure you replace that regularly when you have it serviced. We have a primer bulb. I'd always make sure that I tilt the primer bulb up and it actually is up and down because when you squeeze the fuel through, the primer bulb works when it's sitting up. When it's sideways, it actually only works half as good. So make sure you prime up the fuel, battery's on, then we're ready to start it when our pre-boating checks. So now we're going to talk about the draft of a vessel. The vessel's draft is from the waterline, so let's go from the chine and we'll measure down. I would give that approximately half a metre. If you work on, on an outboard, on average, about half a metre of um, draft. It's measured to the lowest point, whether it's the hull, the propeller, or another reference point on a yacht, like the keel. Okay, so here we have the keel. It's the bottom of a vessel's hull structure located along the center line of the boat. On a yacht, you'd have that great big thing that hangs down. Its true job is to be a counterweight to stop the pressure of the wind rolling the boat over. On this boat, it's only one inch keel. Nice and easy, slick through the water. So here's our front running light on the starboard side, being a green light. Must shine forward from the angle back, two points aft of beam, right round to dead ahead. That's the law, it's 112.5 degrees. So if you fit in nav lights, make sure you have your angle right. Make sure you use them between sunset and sunrise or any time of reduced visibility. The starboard light and the port light must be used when the boat's not at anchor or aground, whether it's drifting, sailing or powering, red and green lights must be on. On a power driven vessel, you leave the anchor light on 100% of the time. It never actually goes off. The most critical thing in having the angles right on your lights in the arc of display is so you know actually which way the vessel is travelling. So if you're looking straight ahead at a boat that's coming at you, you would see red and green to indicate dead ahead. If you could only see the green light, obviously you've got to be on the starboard side and if you can only see the red light, you're on its port side. So once you've done a run through and done all your pre-checks on the boat, it's wise to always have a look at the trailer. Make sure when it's hitched on to the car that you actually lift the button up and make sure it's down. I always like to lift up and double check, make sure it's nice and secure. Uh, we run a safety chain, always make sure it's got a nice shackle to a fixed point on the car. That way if it unhitched, um, the law says that you must run a safety chain. We have a braking system on this particular trailer. You can use a park brake at home, or if you just lift this up, flip it back. When the, the car slows down, that pushes back and activates the brake. We have a reversing lock to stop the, um, the brakes from being applied. Just flip that over, only necessary if you're backing up a hill. Coming through, always make sure the boat's nice and tight on the winch. If it's rattling, what it'll do is rattle the trailer loose quite easily. Always make sure I've got good tyre pressure. You know, around 50 PSI in these light truck tyres on a brakes trailer is a good uh, indication for air pressure. I always like to jack the trailer up, spin the wheel. If you can hear it noisy, the bearing needs to be replaced. Once hooked on, trailer lights fitted up. We'll then come back. back. We've got a good set of LED lights here. I'd always check that my um, uh, trailer lights are working um, correctly by the law. Okay. And on a final note, we've got some tie down straps here to keep the boat on the trailer and support it nice and firm. It's a good tip to have them. You'll also see here, we've got the transducer, which the sounder uh, picks up the depth from. You always want to be careful putting it on and off the trailer. So when you back the trailer down, make sure it's deep enough um, that it doesn't snap that off. It's going to cost you money. So if you're unsure about where, how deep to back the trailer in, here's a good indicator on this particular trailer. I always like to use the rear supporting skids as a good indicator. I like to back the trailer down just so they're touching the water, so the boat's deep enough, um, so it won't damage any of uh, your transducer brackets or hit the bottom of the outboard. Another good indicator if we go to the front, 
um, towards the front where the wheel is, wheels are. On here we actually have a front step. I always like to have that about an inch above. People worry about putting the bearings in the water. I think bearings and trailer lights are just consumables. This is uh, part of your pre-boating pre checks, making sure that the bearing's not failing. Um, I'd rather replace a set of bearings annually than actually damage the boat by not putting it in the water deep enough. It's a really good tip for your, for your wallet. Okay, so to flush the motor out, nice easy set of muffs, about $10, makes it life real easy. You'll notice here on this particular gearbox, instead of having the water pick up central, they're actually slightly forward. So a bad mistake people would find on this particular gearbox is they put them on from the front, but the gearbox tapers, so while you're actually standing at the side, they can slide forward and actually cause engine damage. So these actually need to go on from the rear on this particular motor, over there, cover the holes. We trim the motor down. Make sure it's nice and level. We'll then go and turn the water on. So all you need to do is actually just turn the key and start this engine, it's a fuel injected engine. Okay, so once you've got the muffs fitted correctly, water's on, it's nice easy, turn the engine and start the engine. What we want to look for is water coming out of the telltale here to tell me that it actually is pumping water. Another good check, you'll notice if we go down to the propeller, the last exit point in most outboards would be the water flowing out through the propeller. So it is quite common if you run aground into a sandbank or anything um, and you pick up a bit of grit, you'll actually block the telltale. A nice simple easy test out on the water before you panic is actually trim the motor up, start it up, make sure that the water's circulating out through the bottom of the propeller. You probably haven't got a problem, just a small blockage that needs to be cleaned out, either with a bit of wire or if you've got an air nozzle at home, just to blow that out and make sure you restart the engine and check that it's re-pumping water through the telltale. It's a very common, easy mistake. So that pretty much concludes it, this section in the different parts of a boat for our theory session, and we'll hope to see you soon in one of our classes.